Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host for today's episode, Jamie Hopkins. Excited to have two wonderful individuals here with us on the show today from the SEC. And we're going to dive into a little bit of both of their stories and also where the SEC is going with consumer and investor literacy. Um, so really excited to have this conversation with both Hester and Lori. So thank both of you for joining us here on the show today. Jamie, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to start with a disclaimer for, for my myself and for Lori as well, which is that our views represent our own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or um, any commissioners on the SEC, except in my case, my own views. Yeah, well, it's always good, right? I, before we got recording, I was saying, you know, my wife's an attorney, I'm an attorney. So we've got a lot of, we got the legal disclaimer right in the front. So it's a good start. But <laughs> thanks for both of you joining us here today. Uh, usually what we start off is a little bit of a icebreaker, which is about food. So I'm a big foodie. I love food. And when I think about framework in people's lives, food's such a big part of it. So it fits into the show here for our Carson podcast pretty well. And Lori, I'll go to you first. You're laughing when I said food. So what's your favorite? food item what's what immediately comes to mind for you well i'll be honest with you um i am not particular when it comes to food i like all sorts of food um not allergic to anything but it's summertime here in the dc area so i am a big griller but uh have to be honest with you i grill all the time including in the snow so um you know sweet potatoes on the grill turkey ham uh steaks Whatever. Um, I live in a condo and it seems like when I start grilling, people come out, they bring their dogs also. So, you know, always make, make some extra to share. So that's uh, something I really enjoy doing. That's awesome. Do you have like the common area grill space there where you are, like the outside one? We yeah. do. And uh, like I said, it's sort of like stone soup. Um, <laughs> one person starts it and everyone starts coming out. So it's, it's a good time. I love that. And uh, yeah, that's an amazing thing. You know, food is a connector of people, right? So it brings people out. That's an awesome one. And uh, Commissioner, uh, how about you? That You can uh, decide how you want me to refer to you too, uh, both of you, if you want to be called something else, right? You know, uh, just tell me how you like to go. And it's a, I try to do more f formal there, but whatever's up to you. <laughs> You're welcome to call me Hester. Um, I'm happy with that. I, you know, I, I like Lori like all kinds of food and I'm, I'm not allergic to anything, but um, chocolate, kale and bread are at the top of my uh, at the top of my list. I don't know how to grill. <laughs> uh, do, do you make chocolate kale sandwiches? Because I'm not I don't know about that one. <laughs> um, I probably would try that. I think it, it doesn't sound yeah. bad. So maybe maybe that's my next uh, my next experiment. Yeah, I'm trying to think through a good version of that. So you could probably make like a chocolate balsamic, you know, kind of thing to go on kale on, on some toasted bread. That would probably work pretty well. So, <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, for both of you, we'll try to just keep this, uh, as I said, with whatever I have two people, I, I'll point questions. But if you can decide to mix them up if you want. Another question we love to ask here uh, is about your first money memory. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go... Uh, the opposite way this time. So Hester, uh, do you want to start with that one? Uh, what was your first money memory as a growing up or being a kid? Well, we did not have a lot of money. We weren't getting a big allowance uh, at my house. So any kind of money was a huge deal for me. So I remember being with my, at least I remember my mother telling me the story of she, we were at a funeral and I was, a, a you know, four years old or something like that. And I got stung by a bee. So my mother knew that she could shut me up very quickly. I was crying, of course. But she said, Hester, I'll give you five cents if you stop crying right now. And so I did stop crying right now because that was big money for me. So that's that's my earliest money memory. And Lori, how about you? Do you have a first money memory that comes to mind? You know, I'm not sure if it's the exact first one, but I have to say one that was early on. Uh, we'd gone to the circus and that was sort of a big deal. And the people who were selling different tchotchkes in the crowd and all had these money changers on their belt and, you know, where they would make coins and give you your change back. And I just thought that was the most fascinating thing uh, to the point where eventually I ended up buying one of those because I thought they were so cool. Um, 
However, mine didn't have the pennies, so it just had quarters, dimes, and nickels. But um, that was a, a fun thing. And then I would uh, I would use my allowance because I got a quarter. Um, and if I did extra things, I could make some extra money. And my goal was to try to keep my money changer full. Um, sometimes that also meant pilfering my dad's sock drawer, to be quite honest with you, to find some extra change. <laughs> Did, did you ever get to use that in like a professional setting or did you ever go work at like a amusement park or anything cool like that? I used it when I, I used to sell Girl Scout cookies. Um, but, you know, uh, most of those transactions were dollar bills, but every once in a while it'd be two dollars and 50 cents. And so then I had my little cha-ching, cha-ching, <laughs> here are your two quarters back. So um, that was about the only time I got to use it professionally. Otherwise, it was okay. just for personal entertainment. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that. That's like a way more sophisticated, like fanny pack thing, right? Like this is what I do it as. It's, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's probably, you know, um, that's probably a cool thing because I was like, you know, I we probably will some point in our lives not really see those again too much. I think when we just went back to, we went down to Rehoboth uh, Beach in uh, Delaware, and I think they still had some people with them there that were running the machines and stuff. So they're still around and in action out there. Uh, all right, I'll go. Uh, we'll start to shift a little bit here. And I know uh, often we just ask people a little bit about their journey. And so, Lori, uh, from selling Girl Scout cookies and, you know, working the change belt, uh, you know, how did you end up in kind of the investor education and uh, literacy side of the world? How did you get excited about this? You know, totally by accident. And I'm so thankful for that journey. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an attorney. So that was one thing I had going for me as far as sort of some direction from a younger age. Um, however, I just never knew where that was going to actually take me. Um, so, uh, you know, went to undergrad, was a philosophy major, which of course meant I had to go to uh, more, to get more education. So I went off to law school. Um, came out of law school and uh, actually started with a real estate management firm and did such a great job there that uh, was able to put the whole division out of business. Uh, they had been in problems with HUD with the contract and we got the contract turned around to the point then where the company decided we're going to lay everybody off because we want to get out of this contract and that was the way to do it. <clears throat> so uh, what do you do at that point? I uh, go and um, hook up with a management company. Uh, this time, though, working on broker dealer side and investment advisor side. So I actually uh, had my Series 7 license and Series 66 and my life and health insurance licenses. And um, I have to say, it was interesting sitting on the other side of the desk because uh, I always felt like, wow, if I couldn't put my parents and some of the products we were selling and the way we were selling them. Um, I didn't want to put other people in that either. So uh, I put in a resume. This was back in the day when it was a paper resume and uh, took it over to the SEC's Office of Human Resources and actually applied for a job in, in enforcement. And um, instead, I got a call about this fairly new office that had just been stood up in the late 90s. So I'm talking this would have been 2001. Um, so just, you know, turn of the century. And um, this is Office of Investor Education and Assistance at the time. And they took uh, investor complaints and questions and then put out just a little bit of investor ed type materials to sort of say, hey, this is what's going on. And to be honest with you, the rest is sort of history. I was hired as a staff attorney, and I took investor complaints and questions, congressional inquiries, chairman's inquiries, and uh, responded to those and sort of have moved up through the ranks over the years. Uh, I love that story. Yeah, it's a, it rings true for another attorney who started off in private equity and then eventually found him his way out of there. <laughs> So I was like, yeah, I, I totally get that. Um, and, and so, uh, Hester, how about you? How was your path to the SEC? Well, um, I came to the SEC about the same time as Lori the first time around. So that's the that's where the commonality in our stories ends, I think. Well, except that we both have the same concern, I think, for, uh, for investor education and for investor protection. But um, I did not know I wanted to be a lawyer. I sort of fell into that. 
but I did, I, I majored in economics under undergrad. And, and so I wanted to combine economics and law and securities law was a good, was a good place to be for that. And so um, ended up at a law firm that did a lot of securities and then came to the SEC because I had heard that the SEC was a fantastic place to work, which it is, um, put in a plug for that. Um, but, but also, um, understanding securities law, I think you really need to be inside a regulator to fully understand it. Um, and, and I did like the idea of being able to, um, to see it from the inside. And then also I was working when I first came to the SEC on writing rules, which sounds very dull and is not what I had intended to do when I went to law school, but actually is a fascinating thing to do and really interesting to be able to think about it from the perspective of a regulator so that you have a much bigger range of options than you have when you're working for a private side client, right? You're really trying to get to the right result. Um, and so obviously I was very junior when I first came to the SEC, but um, having a part in that process of, of writing, writing rules to try to get to the right place, the right balance of investor protection, but also allowing, allowing for, for choice and, and allowing investors to have some decision-making authority of their own. Um, that was a lot of fun for me. I really like how you framed up that around, you know, the protections plus choice, because I think that we've at least seen that in some areas from the behavioral side, right? Where people like framework, but they also like to be able to actually still make decisions inside of there. And uh, so let's, I guess, kind of move into that realm of uh, this conversation which is, uh, maybe I'll start there first. I think both of you um, care very deeply about like consumer protection and investor protection. So uh, maybe this is the kind of plug for the SEC and why rulemaking is important, but I'd love to just kind of hear, like, why do you find that to be so important? Why do we need the, the kind of protections for investors and consumers out there uh, today? Maybe more so, you know, than ever, if you feel that way or, or not. So I'd love to just kind of, maybe we'll start there just on consumer protections and the importance of it. Well, why, Lori, why don't you start, since Lori is the head of our Office of Investor mm -hmm. Education and Advocacy, she thinks about these issues um, all the time from that perspective, and then I'll fill in from my perspective. Great, happy to. You know, um, so, a couple things have happened over the course of, you know, uh, how people utilize the stock market in the United States. One was, you know, people used to work at a job, say, for 30, 40 years. They stayed with the same company. They got a pension that lasted them through um, their life and even their spouse's life. And then the rules changed. So in the 70s, that's when 401ks were passed and made part of um, the Internal Revenue Code. They became popular in the 80s. And things really took off from there. Prior to that, you know, investing was pretty much for wealthy people. And they were the ones who had the most exposure to the stock market. Well, now we've gone from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans. So the rules change. Okay, you are now in charge of your own destiny. You need to put money away for your retirement. Good luck to you. Go forth and prosper. Uh, and we didn't have, you know, anyone you know, who was saying, hey, here's some education with this. Here's um, maybe some guardrails or maybe some certain products or fees and expenses. And also, we're always also looking out for, hey, watch out for this. It may be a fraud. So someone who, you know, is always trying to take the easy way out and take your, someone else's hard-earned money. So with that in mind, that's why I said our office wasn't stood up until uh, – you know, the 1990s at the SEC, which has been around since 1934. So that's why it's so crucial because people's livelihood, their peace of mind really depends on this. You know, what's first and foremost in people's mind as they get closer to retirement? Do I have enough money? Do I have enough assets? Am I going to outlive those assets? And so that's why it's so important. And nothing will derail that faster than if someone runs into a fraudster either early or in retirement. And so, you know, taking fraud out of the way now, okay, what about those impact of fees? Um, what's the rate of return? Uh, how much risk can I take? 
And those are types of things that we try day in and day out in the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy to um, educate people on. And to also, you know, we're an unbiased resource. We're not trying to sell anyone anything. So, I, you know, I want people to go to investor.gov. I want them to use the resources and tools that are available there. I want them to read our investor alerts and bulletins so that they can make, you know, wise financial decisions. And again, you know, also trying to avoid fraud, but also understand, you know, hey, we've got some new products out here. Well, we'll put out an investor bulletin on those products so people can understand them. We don't tell people what they can or can't invest in, but we just want them to be you know, an educated investor so they're making those informed decisions. Now, the impact of rulemaking, I'm gonna let Commissioner Purse talk a little <laughs> bit more about that. So thanks, Lori. I think that's a great um, overview of why, why it's important for the SEC to have this investor outreach function where um, investors can go for information and, and like Lori, I'm going to um, put in a plug for investor.gov. There's a lot of material there. It's very helpful to sort through um, different questions that you might have, um, the, the questions that come in, the common questions that come in. You can find answers there on the on the website. So when I think about the SEC's mission, it, we, it's, a, it's a tripart tripartite mission. So it's investor protection, facilitating capital formation, and um, fostering fair, orderly, and efficient markets. So our, our rules are, do, are trying to accomplish those things. Um, I approach regulation from the perspective of this is the United States, and so people should be generally free to engage in transactions that they are voluntarily entering into, um, as long as both sides, both sides of the transaction are voluntarily entering in, that's fine. But the SEC can play a role in making sure that the investor in a transaction is not at an information disadvantage so that she has the information that she needs to make a decision about a product. It's her decision, but she needs to have that information there for it. Um, and then we want our, our, our markets to be fair, orderly, and efficient, which means that there are certain guard, guardrails we build around it. And I think it is because people know that they can enter into our markets and they'll be treated in a way that is consistent with what the disclosures say um, and that everyone will be playing by those same rules of the marketplace. People feel comfortable being in the markets because of that. And that's where we come in as a regulator to keep that keep those parameters of the market uh, working properly, make sure that people know what they're getting, um, make sure that people are abiding by some basic rules, but then within that, allowing people freedom to make choices for themselves. I think both those answers were, were kind of beautiful their own ways. And there's two things I, I pulled out of that too, which is you know, getting back to kind of allowing people to have the information that they need, right? To make informed decisions becomes a big part of this. So uh, you, you mentioned the resource of investor.gov. You know, how is getting information out to people changed? Now, Laura, you said you know, you've been there now since going back to the early 2000s. People were not consuming information in the identical way that they are today. How is the SEC approaching this differently now? How are you seeing investors just inter engage or interact with this education differently? You know, I, I go back to paper brochures. Um, you know, faxes were still sort of fairly new. People um, did not access their accounts online. They actually went into a brick and mortar building and sat down with someone. So. Um, you know, the telephone is still alive and well, um, and we've seen all of these different mediums used over the years, but add to it, you know, social media, the power of, you know, online persuasion, um, how people, like you said, consume their information. And it's these short snippets, so you must be relevant in a very small amount of time. Um, you know, people generally aren't going to sit down for a half day conference on this type of topic. So how do we make that digestible and presentable to people? So we, we've morphed over the years and we, we try to stay up with that. You know, um, investor.gov came into being uh, when I came back to the SEC in 2009. That's when we first launched investor.gov. And with that, we also then had a presence on social media. 
So we, we do have, you know, a Facebook account and a Twitter account. And to be honest with you, we don't interact with social media the way that most people interact with social media. We push out information, but we don't generally have a dialogue. And there are several mm -hmm. reasons for that. So we know that we're sort of punching with one arm behind our back, if you will. But there's there are some real legitimate reasons why we interact in that way. Um, but some creative ways that we've, you know, interacted with people when, you know, People are getting their information online. Well, then that means we need to be there. Um, we there was um, I invest ICOs were very popular several years ago. Initial coin offerings, mm -hmm. and so people were just getting their information online and sort of blindly investing in these, and they they were ripe with fraud in many cases. And so we launched our own ICO uh, called Howie Coins. So HowieCoins.com, it had a white paper. Um, it had an urgency to invest. You could get a discount if you invested uh, by June. And so people wanted to invest in it. And when they clicked on Invest Now, they got a message from us saying, hey, this is a fraud. And if you were to try to invest in something like this, you could be taken. You know, and so and here's some here's some information for you to you know, sort of see these red flags of fraud. So we've tried to be creative in this way. And then also we have a public service campaign that is focused um, not just on television, but again, social media, um, search function, as well as um, online, like, you know, different channels, uh, whether they're podcasts or um uh, like Hulu and, and some of the other ways people access information. So we try to be there. We know we, we lag and there are some impediments to us sometimes uh, taking advantage of certain ways to communicate, but we do try to be there to meet people where they are. But we also still accept faxes. I still have some paper brochures um, because I know some, you know, there's some demographics of folks who like to have that to take home from a conference. So um, we try to, you know, meet people where they are. I, I love the uh, the Howie coin one and uh, that's that that was really well done by the way too it was uh, yeah I think I wrote about it in an article for Forbes back when you guys did it so that was fantastic it was really funny and uh, I used to do a similar so I taught uh, like life insurance contract law for a while and I would do a similar thing in the class so like there was like a virtual option so I'd have all the students sign this like one page sheet and I put all this like nonsense in there right about how they owe me money and I get to rename their firstborn kids and stuff like that and like they would all just sign it right I'd be like hey just here's this just sign it and then I'd have somebody stand up and read it and everyone be laughing so um, I, I love that you guys did that on a mass scale too because it got a lot of attention right it's a, a brought a lot of awareness to the topic so that's awesome um, and I would just add to that, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of um, embracing new technology, understanding its limitations and its it, the challenges that it poses. I think Lori is right that uh, with with social media comes um, so, come some good things and some bad things, right? It, it, it does. The ability to communicate with people so quickly um, is, is something that fraudsters take advantage of unfortunately. Um, so I'm glad to see that we as an agency are trying to engage more with people in those those places. I think we have also tried to um, allow financial firms to communicate with their customers and clients through the, these modern forms of communication. Um, it's not only it's not only good for the firm, but it's good for the customer and investor, importantly, to be able to get information in a form that they're actually more likely to consume, more likely to process and analyze. So um, I'd like to see us give even more flexibility um, to firms to, to be creative in the way they, they communicate with investors. Now, of course, that's there are dangers to that too, right? And so we have to we have to play our regulatory role in that space as well, but we can't as regulators always fall back to, well, your, your first thought should be that it's a paper document um, and then we'll maybe talk to you about other things because I think now often the first thought is not going to be a, a paper document. It's going to be some kind of dynamic um, interaction over a mobile phone or 
um, over a computer, and we have to allow for that. I think we haven't always been very successful. So even recently, we um, adopted a, a new form called a client or customer relationship summary, and that is intended to provide investors with a really important set of, you know, basic facts about the financial professional, the financial firm they're engaging with. But it's so dense that it's very difficult for people to interact with. And I would have preferred us to take a less paper-based approach to that. I think one that allowed for the more dynamic um, interaction. We didn't demand that, that it only be in paper, but the paper was sort of our fallback position for that. And I think it would be worthwhile for us to take a look at that and see is there a way that we can allow for, for um, an interaction that will really help the investor understand what is this financial firm? What is it offering? How is it going to charge me for what it's offering? Um, and what are the what are the range of services and products that I'll have access to? Those are those are very important things to know. What are the responsibilities and duties that the financial firm and financial professional has? Those are things that people need to know, but they're not necessarily going to absorb that if it comes in a very dense paper document. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for bringing that one up, the CRS forms and ADVs. And, you know, I'm I'm notorious, at least on social media, for somebody who likes to go and look at everybody's ADV forms. And, <laughs> like, I like looking at them. But um, I think in a similar sense, you know, a lot of people will always say, like, they're still complex, right? Um, and I think there's a big benefit to giving that information to consumers. And I'm, like, totally, I think that we still probably have too many things not out there. But I, then I look at them and like if you're not fairly knowledgeable on like what an ADV is supposed to read like and what's supposed to be in there, what is missing. And sometimes when I look at one and I'm like, I don't I don't know that they put everything they should have put in there um, because sometimes I'll get to the end and I'll see the person's relationship with other things. And they're like, hey, we have no conflicts. And I see that they sit on like three boards of companies that provide products to other things. So I'm like, well, we're probably somewhat close, but. Uh, and, and I think even when you get to that page and you, you kind of see like ADV in these different parts, I, I think from a consumer standpoint, like if you're building a CX for consumers, you'd never build it like that to display information, right? Like if we had to sell a product in the sense of information, like Amazon would never design the page like that to get across the information. So I think there's things like that as we grow up on the tech side away from like paper considerations, we can get people better information because to me... Right. Like that's huge if consumers can actually click on an advisory firm and like really quickly pull it out versus I mean, some ADVs are incredibly long. And again, right, if you don't if you haven't been through a bunch, it could be hard to figure out, like, what am I learning from uh, this document? Any thoughts you know, on that, that, too? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. This is Lori. It just um, that's one thing that we really have worked hard on and we've worked with you know it's not just our information at the sec so we have state securities regulators uh, represented through nasa the north american securities administrators association as well as finra self-regulatory organization the financial industry regulatory authority and you know from an investor ed perspective we always want people to look at the individual with whom they're going to be doing business and so um if you put in the person's name whether you go through investor.gov or through broker check, um, you will now see sort of a dynamic list of disclosures. So it'll, it's a little bit of a roadmap, if you will, so that the people will know, hey, look, I need to take a look at this, or this is when they got their licenses. Hey, look, there was um, maybe a regulatory action taken by one of the regulators, or the person filed for bankruptcy or you know something whatever and you'll see that um like i said sort of as a roadmap so you'll know where to start looking when you get into the, the forms more deeply and just to underscore what Lori said i think it really is important for people to look up the person um, that they're planning to do to do business with to get advice from um to tr entrust their funds to um you you can't assume um that that you know, the person is going to treat you uh, honestly. And so looking looking the person's background up as a start and then just being 
on the alert if if something doesn't seem right in the sense of you're asking questions and you're not getting answers. It's okay for you to say, you know what, I'm going to go somewhere else to have my retirement funds managed. You're under no obligation to go to the first person you meet with. So, um, you know, shopping around is okay. And I think um, Lori's, Lori's office does a really good job at trying to empower investors to at least have the base knowledge to ask the questions they need to ask um, to, to then figure out who they're comfortable working with. Yeah, let's go to that one, too. Um, I, I know that there's not a perfect set of questions to ask somebody, but there's some good questions, right? Um, Lori, where do you guys usually start with uh, on if you're going to meet somebody, you know, what should you be asking? And I also think for our, our audience, it's always like, what should you be ready to answer, right? Like a lot of advisors, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll write an article and say, hey, you should ask them about this, or you could ask them about this if you're a consumer. And some advisors are like, I don't want anyone asking me about that. And then I was like, well, then that person shouldn't work with you. It's actually pretty straightforward. Like if you don't want to answer that, that's okay. And they don't need to work with you either. <laughs> <laughs> right, it is a two-way street. So, um, you know, first off, how did you find out this person? Did they come looking for you or did you go looking for them? That's sort of the first thing because, um, you know, when someone, an unsolicited contact, uh, you don't ever quite know who you're dealing with. And so, you know, we, we want people to uh, trust but verify. And so that's, that's where we come in because we do have some tools and people can do these background checks and find out information um, and the people that you're doing it on, they don't know that you're looking at their background. So, you know, you're doing this anonymously. It doesn't cost anything. Um, but we want people to, you know, sort of how long have you been in the business? What type of business do you have? Are you a fee-based business? Do you work off commission? How are you paid? Um, what type, you know, what's been the outcome for your other clients? Um, how? And, but this is also, you know, Remember when it comes to investing, this is a very personal thing. You know, what's good for your neighbor or for your brother may not be good for you. And so this is something you, know, you need to have that comfort level with the professional. You know, and like the commissioner said, if you, if you don't have that comfort level or if you just want to shop around, do so and do it before you turn over your money. OK, um, because sir, once you, you're, you're working with someone, it, you can get your money out and transfer but there's some stickiness to it. And so people have a tendency not to do that, even when it's like, yeah, you know, I never quite like this aspect of something. And it's like, well, then change it. But even better, don't get into it to begin with until you feel comfortable. So taking those tools, using those resources, um, you know, making sure this is a good fit for you, for your family, for the goals you're trying to achieve. That, that's sort of the best thing we can do. And you know, a lot of people, well, I just work off my gut, you know, and it's like, this is actually one area where research has shown um, the gut check may not be the best check here. So please independently verify. And I have to tell you, scam artists are, are getting smarter and trickier with this, where they're actually using the name of registered people. So sure, go check me out and on investor.gov. So now it's you've got to make sure you're actually dealing with the person who works at that firm. So you know, don't just contact them through um, however they contacted you or at the telephone number they contacted you. You may need to call the firm independently to make sure you're actually dealing with that registered rep. Um, some of these, like I said, scam artists are getting smarter and smarter and trying to even use some of our tools against us. And then I would just supplement that with the, the advice that I have for financial professionals is you should want your customers and clients to know how you're getting paid and to, to understand um, what conflicts you have. That's, that's to everyone's benefit that you lay it out there um, and let people understand an informed client is actually a better client for you to have. And it's, it's, going to be better down the line um, that you you know that you've been fully transparent with a person. So we have rules on that, of course, but I think from a self-interested perspective, you should also want to be conveying that information to people. 
Yeah, actually, about probably four years ago, when I was still teaching at American College, we did a study on kind of like the, I don't know, power of advice. And one of the things that we found were consumers that like stated that they understood their you know, advisors compensation before engaging them were actually like way more satisfied with them. They were more confident in general and they were more likely to refer business to them. So I always got to that like totally self right serving aspect is like if you're more transparent and clear, you get the right clients and they actually want to be with you versus convincing somebody who probably didn't want to work with you then if you had to hide from that, right? Like that's not the right person for you. Um, I think a lot of times advisors lose confidence in that area. They just don't feel confident about talking about their value and how they charge. And sometimes it's other things, but I, I've seen that to be an issue out there too. Uh, let's go to the the literacy topic. Uh, and, and Lori, I'll come back to you on that. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge with the financial or investing literacy that we have out there today? Uh, you know, we see all those studies that always say, you know, people are probably lacking in certain areas of knowledge that we wish they had more knowledge in. Um, and what are some of the things that I guess that the SEC is doing in your division to improve upon that? You know, one thing is, it, it still is amazing to me that this is not taught to every child in school. Um, and that's something that, you know, we have worked on literally for decades and with other organizations and with other agencies. Um, it's just, it's such a crucial life skill. And, you know, you when you turn 18, you can go out there and make a whole bunch of mistakes early on in your life. That, you know, financial mistakes that can you pay for for decades if you don't understand, um, you know, sort of the rules of the road here. And, I'm, and these aren't all investing by any stretch. You know, this includes credit cards. It includes student loans. That's the whole thing. You know, I wish financial literacy was as easy as saying wearing a seatbelt, you know, click it or ticket. That's a one step shop done. Financial literacy, though, that's much broader. And so, you know, the SEC, we have one small piece of that pie and we're, we're, we're the only agency that truly focuses on investing. So that's what I am primarily focused on. That's what my team is focused on. And, you know, some of the things that, you know, we want to talk to people about is one, getting that emergency fund set up so that when you hit those little wrinkles in life and they come and we might be in the middle of one right now where, you know, there's a downturn or maybe you have an unexpected bill where you don't end up having to take on high credit card debt or high credit or high, you know, um, credit, some type of debt that costs more than it should in order to weather that storm. So having that set up is one of the most crucial things. And if you do have high debt, sometimes paying that off is your best return. You know, it's a, say you're, you've got a debt that's at 20 percent right now. Um, there's nothing I can say you can invest in where you're going to get a guaranteed 20% return. So paying that down may be the best thing. But for those who are saying going into the workforce for the first time, if you can just sock away some money into your company's 401k or 403b or thrift savings plan, or even just, you know, an IRA, an individual retirement account, putting that money away early and not touching it for decades and having it invested in something, even, you know, just uh, an index fund, low fees, broad exposure. So you have diversification where it has a chance to build over time. That is the strongest piece of advice I can give anyone. If I could give advice, that would be it. I can't <laughs> give advice, but boy, the power of compound interest is real and you can never make up um, that time value of money, it, it, if you wait until you're 30 even, you know, 10 years beyond, it's amazing how much more money you have to put. And by the time you're 40, I mean, you, you just can't make it up. And so that's the thing, starting early, putting it on an automatic, as your pay rate goes up, increase how much you're putting away. And that time value of money should help ensure that you have a comfortable retirement down the road. Uh, but just getting started early and getting people where they are not starting off in the hole, I think, is a yeah. huge thing. And that's something that we talk about um, at all of our uh, different types of outreach events that we have. 
Lori, can I just say I love your passion there? <laughs> it just comes through, right? So you're sitting across the screen, and I'm like, yeah, it's just exuding how much you care about that. So I love it. And I just want to underscore, I mean, this is this is what I, I'm so grateful that we have Lori at our agency because I think she does give the most passionate uh investor education that I've ever heard. So I think it's it's fantastic. But I, I so wholeheartedly agree with her that early financial education is really important. And I, I love how you started the show by asking us about our early money memories. Um, that is a question I've never been asked, but I think every child does have a very distinct early money memory. And so it's, it's very obvious that that's the time when you should start teaching kids um, about how to handle money and how to think about money. And, and so there's, there's absolutely no reason that I, they shouldn't start learning in elementary school about these topics. Um, and, and that would then, I think, help people as they, as they enter adulthood, not only to think about managing their money, but it probably would convince some of them that they want to become securities lawyers or go into uh, the financial industry. So that could serve us as well. Yeah, my uh, my daughter is five, and I try to teach her about money. But what she's actually learned better at this point is negotiation. So she's, she's got two lawyer parents, and she's always like, you want to make a deal. Like, that's how she starts every conversation now. She knows that things are negotiable. So <laughs> we've taught her something at this point. Uh, yeah, and the, the I think this came out of a couple other spots. But uh, one of the things that I've learned a lot about kind of teaching literacy and I've worked with a couple different programs out there through colleges and, and nonprofits, which is I, I think a lot of people have to envision themselves with money, too, or like the impact it has before they really get super like involved with it. So like sometimes I'll go and teach in programs where the parents of the students don't have a lot of money and they're kind of like, yeah, it's important, but like we don't have money. So like you have to find that way to like get them interested uh, we have a new like moniker thing we're always doing at Carson now, which is actually in front of me too. I have a mouse pad, but I don't own a mouse, so I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But it's like, find your freedom. And we like talk about that, right? Like, is it work optional? Is it giving back to society? Whatever it is. And then you can kind of build in how money plays a role in that, which I think has been a really fun thing for us to spend time on here. Uh, let me go to this one. And, and uh, Hester, I'm going to come back to you. Where do you think social media, because you brought this up before, can play a bigger role in this moving forward? Because like um, both positive and negative, and then we'll kind of close out with one question after this, because I see things like TikTok, tons of information out there, not all of it good, right? We say same fraud issues, bad information, the whole like LLC avoid tax thing, you know, is pretty rampant in there. If you're like an attorney and you watch the like, just put everything in LLC and charge one dollar and write off everything, and you're like, okay, this is not how any of that works. But um, you know, I see a lot of that out there today, so I'll open that up, uh, kind of to both of you. Yeah, I mean, I think social media is definitely a, a way that people want to get and consume information, and I think that's that's perfectly fine. It's just that people have to remember that they have to consider the source they're getting the information from, um, consider whether that source uh, is maybe not telling you, but is maybe actually getting paid to promote the product um, or the firm. So be careful about that. Um, and then I think uh, we as regulators need to need to acknowledge that social media is a way that people are communicating try to be there ourselves, try to try to uh, meet people, as Lori said, where they are, um, we can we can use social media to communicate our message as well. But I mean, at the end of the day, people need to be careful, they can get information from lots of places, they just need to be careful about um, acting on it without maybe doing some other research, or if they don't feel comfortable themselves, making decisions, thinking about finding a financial professional and then doing the, the work to make sure that the financial professional that you're working with, as, as Lori was talking about before, um, is who she says she is. And, uh, you know, what's what's that person's background? How's that person getting paid? So I think it's it's a, it can be a piece, but it can't be the only answer to your financial uh, to your financial planning needs. Lori, anything you want to add there? You feel like that was. You know, I, I totally agree. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit st uh, step further. Is 
it's so easy also now to invest through apps and things. You know, that used to be a big barrier to entry. You had to have thousands of dollars in order to even open an account. That's not the case any longer. But again, do your homework on the front end and make sure it's right for you. But, um, you know, trust but verify. Those are pretty good words to live by here. <laughs> yeah, and the, the ability to invest um, smaller amounts incrementally is, is really a powerful thing when you're trying to think about saving and investing for the future. But you do, as with anything else, if you're going to be putting money into something, you know, just make sure that you, you know what you're putting it into and that you know how much you're paying for that and, and so forth. So um, can definitely be convenient and useful, but you should still be doing your homework. Well, I want to be respectful of time. It's actually like my only real job here is to keep us mostly on time. And uh, I still want to get the last question because we love to close with this and maybe narrow it down a little bit more. But for both of you, when you look out at the investor world, what would you like your legacy to be? And I know it's a big question, legacy, but uh, what would that impact or legacy you'd like to be out there? And we go Lori and then uh, Commissioner, and then we'll close out here. Wow. Leg legacy is a huge thing. Um, you know, in my job, uh, we have an ability to help individuals. You know, I and I may not be changing the world, but I, I know um, the work that my team does uh, has helped people, um, individuals. Even bef sometimes, you know, I we've gotten a letter where you know, someone didn't invest money in something that was a fraud because they found our materials ahead of time. That, that certainly doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it does. I had a man that came up to me at a conference and I wasn't quite sure how this was going to go. He's like, did you write this brochure on, on mutual funds? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm responsible for it. I didn't write it, but it came <laughs> out of my team. And he just smiled. He said, thank you. It has made me rich, <laughs> you know? And so that to me um, is worthwhile and it makes me get up every day and want to do my job um, for my, something in the future. I would love to not have any more fraud in the world. Uh, that may be a bit uh, Pollyanna-ish, but that's something. The more we can do to help you know, make sure people don't fall victim to that would just be fabulous. Well, it reminded me of the starfish story. Do you know that one? And you got the waves behind yourself, right? The boy. Do you know that one? Yeah. And throwing each starfish back in and say, well, at least I saved that one. Right. <laughs> well, and I think that Lori actually and her team are um, making a real difference um, for the better in the world. And, and it, do, it, you know, it works one investor at a time, right? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, always mean grand um, changes all at once, but it's investor at a time and that investor tells another investor hey you want to check out investor.gov you want to you want to ask some questions before you invest we can get word of mouth working in our favor as well um, and so I hope that's something we do in terms of my legacy uh, look I, you know the the SEC is a regulator with a really long and important history and and the the US securities markets are the finest in the world I want them to stay that way um, I do want us as a regulator to be more open to innovation, allowing people freedom and flexibility to invest in products and services that they're interested in. But also I want as with that goes the message that there is individual responsibility and you can't assume that someone else is doing the work for you. So, um, with freedom goes goes responsibility. And so I'm trying to underscore those two messages at the same time. I don't think the government should be making decisions for people. The reason that we're here and we're here to give you information is so that you can make good decisions, either yourself or with the help of someone else. Um, but you do have to, you do have to affirmatively take a role in doing that. So it's, it's presenting that balanced view um, that I would like my legacy well, to I be. Think both of those are fantastic legacies and a beautiful way to close out this episode. And so, Lori and Hester, thank you so much for joining us here today on this episode of the Framework Podcast and for impacting all those investors out there, providing right both that information and choice uh, that we very much need. So thank you both for being here, and thanks everybody else for listening to this episode of the Framework Podcast.